Hello students, this is uh, Professor McDermott. Um, I wanted to give you a lecture uh, this time to give you some background for the readings that we are going to be doing on African American uh, religion. I have to say that I'm a little abashed to be giving this lecture to you, my students, uh, not being an African American and uh, not even claiming to be particularly deep in spirituality, but um, I, I, I just hope you'll bear with me, and if there is anything that I say in this lecture that you um, disagree with or that you have evidence to the contrary, please, uh, please feel free to bring it up um, on the discussion board because I don't claim to have the um, exhaustive knowledge of this topic. However, I'm drawing on uh, a number of books and essays that I have read uh, on the subject of African American religion, especially um, a book by Eddie Glaude, uh, who's a great scholar of African American religion at Princeton, called uh, African American Religion, a very short um, introduction. So um, these <laughs> Uh, are African American uh, religious distinctives, again drawing on um, the Glaude book. Um, but Glaude also uh, cites the great uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, masterpiece, The Souls of Black Folk, which was published in 1903. Um, in Du Bois's mind, there were uh, three unique things about African American religion that set it apart. Uh, first of all, the emphasis on preaching and um, eloquence in preaching as um, something that was highly uh, valued in African American religion. Second, the great importance of music um, to African American worship. Um, and it's, it's not hard to understand uh, why this would be. I mean, during much of the period of slavery, African Americans were forbidden to learn to read um, or write, and even Christian missionaries were forbidden to teach African Americans to read um, the Bible. And so um, we're talking about a predominantly oral culture uh, for many years, and so the, the emphasis on music really um, fits in with that uh, emphasis on orality. Finally, uh, what Du Bois calls the frenzy, and we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, shortly. Um, Eddie Glaude has a different set of distinctives. First of all, he says that um, in African American religion, um, there's always a practice of freedom. In other words, um, the church is meant to be a space of um, freedom for its uh, participants in many of the themes uh, of African American spirituality have to do with this uh, cherishing of uh, freedom. Second, um, the desire for African American spirituality and worship to be a sign of difference which sets apart the African American community and African American culture from um, other predominantly white religious uh, organizations. And third, uh, Glaude identifies an open-ended orientation, that is, the refusal to get tied down to um, doctrines or uh, dogmas uh, simply because uh, they are considered to be orthodox teaching um, an openness to the spirit, a certain flexibility, uh, and willingness to change um, and develop uh, the spirituality over um, time. So, um, now, <laughs> this is where we get into Du Bois's um, so-called frenzy, um, and a lot of that has to do with what um, historians call um, syncretism, and actually anthropologists and, and scholars of religion use this term uh, as well. Um, and, and we see it often with the evangelization of native indigenous people in uh, the Americas, that 
uh, for instance, Indians would convert to Christianity, but they would, in, in subtle ways, combine their traditional religious um, beliefs with the new teaching of um, Christianity. And so uh, the religion as practice for these native converts was a kind of combination of their traditional uh, native religious views plus the new teachings they had gotten from the missionaries. And we see that very much in um, African American religion as well. Um, certainly <laughs> missionaries who were working with African Americans at, you know, did not by and large uh, encourage African Americans to keep their African culture or African religious practices in um, any way. However, um, a lot of African American religion uh, took place in, in unsupervised venues in what were called praise houses that uh, slaves um, and free blacks built themselves. They were often, you know, out in a forest uh, or some isolated place and um, people would make their way to them sometimes in um, the middle of the night so as to have their own um, religious uh, meetings without being interfered with by um, the white master class. So um, it is clear, and I, I think scholars of African American religion generally agree that it's clear that certain practices um, that became common in the African American uh, churches uh, originally came from Africa, such as um, the ring shout, um, which is, uh, in, in its African context, this was a, a ritual dance in which people would uh, simply uh, dance around in a, in a circle, um, shuffling their feet. Um, and this, uh, in African American religion became known, uh, was transformed, yes, but in its new form it became known as um, the Ring Shout. Also um, imported from African religion, the scholars tell us, was a new version <laughs> of what in Africa was called spirit possession. Okay, so uh, it was not uncommon at uh, African religious events for an individual to become possessed by the spirit of um, a god and to go into a trance and to serve as a medium um, between this world and um, the spirit uh, world. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about how this manifested during the First Great Awakening, um, but uh, this, this is part of the frenzy that Du Bois uh, talks about in which um, at least in some African-American denominations, um, as well as in some white denominations that were influenced by African-American religion, like the Pentecostals, um, there is this, there is this uh, kind of um, trance-like state that, that believers can go into in which they're essentially um, channeling an, uh, the supernatural world. Um, also, uh, the theme of death and rebirth shows some continuity between African religion and African American um, religion. Um, and baptism in official black Christianity um, is often seen in terms of the image of crossing the Jordan, which is a biblical image. But um, this uh, scholars have shown does connect to certain African beliefs about uh, what it means to cross a river or to cross uh, a body of water, a kind of death and rebirth experience. Um, also, the um, um, custom of falling out at uh, religious services, or maybe the more official name for this is slain in the spirit, when uh, people under the influence of the Holy Spirit will simply uh, pass out on the floor and, uh, you know, for some time will be in a state of um, religious ecstasy. Uh, this is uh, believed to be a continuity with the practice of African um, religion. 
Something that doesn't directly come from Africa, but does have to do with the um, African-American slave experience, um, is the predominance of certain biblical themes in African-American uh, preaching. Um, so, for example, um, one story that was very dear to uh, religious African-Americans was the story in the book of Exodus about Moses leading the Hebrew people out of slavery um, from Egypt to um, the Promised Land. So this, uh, you know, this theme was uh, very predominant in African American worship, and there were certainly other themes from the Bible along the same lines that seemed to promise um, liberation. Um, here too, this 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 kind of connects with uh, a modern trend in theology known as liberation theology. This really comes out of Latin America, um, uh, and it, it's common to both Catholics and Protestants in Latin America. The idea of Jesus as um, a liberator, whose primary task, in a way, is to liberate uh, the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden from. Um, from their oppressors. So, um, and, and, and we see this also in African American religion. Um, I want to talk about agency too. I, I, if you think back to the discussion we had about um, uh, Native Americans um, who converted to Christianity at um, Christian missions, um, you know, people used to think that they were just brainwashed <laughs> in a sense by the missionaries or they were forced by the missionaries to convert or they were enticed with offers of gifts and so forth. But in recent years, scholars have emphasized the agency of those native converts. In other words, that they did have their own reasons for uh, converting to the Christian faith. A, a very important one being um, they thought that it would help to bring them immunity or healing for the post-contact diseases because they saw that um, Europeans were not by and large dying of these diseases whereas their own people were dying uh, unfortunately in droves. Um, now African Americans also showed agency in their uh, conversions to um, Christianity the goals were somewhat different, not so much healing from physical disease, but healing, if you will, from the disease of slavery and all of the um, indignities and dehumanization that that um, brought. So um, African-American religion became, for many believers, a source of, again, a distinctive identity over against their white captors, and also of empowerment, of a sense of supernatural or spiritual power that was going to um, sustain them through their ordeal and ultimately lead them to um, a free life. Um, and connected to this, you see that often when um, slaves would revolt, the leader of the rebellion would be um, someone who was an African-American religious leader or a, a visionary who received messages from God um, telling, telling them that it was time for uh, African-Americans to revolt. We see this in the Denmark Vesey Rebellion. We see this in the Nat Turner um, Rebellion. And it, it just drives home the point that for African-Americans, um, their church <laughs> or their churches did they uh, they did see them as a source of um, empowerment not of conformity to white culture but as something they were creating uh, picking and choosing the themes and the practices that were of interest um, to them themes that would give them hope uh, for resistance and and for a better future um, in the last unit we talked about the first um, great awakening and now I want to turn to the very important role that African Americans played uh, in that uh, religious um, event. First of all, it's very interesting to see what the attitude of the instigator of the Great Awakening, George Whitfield, was toward uh, African Americans. Now, George Whitfield was a slaveholder. 
so uh, certainly he bears the guilt of that. But if if you read his uh, his letters, it's quite interesting the, the the way that he insists, and you see some of his words there on um, the screen. I won't repeat them all, but um, he insists that other slave owners should make it a priority to teach um, African Americans uh, the Christian faith and also should treat them in uh, a humane way and as Christian brothers and sisters um, not to uh, subject them to the quote inhuman usage of cruel um, taskmasters uh, end quote. So um, there was at least some attempt to try to lessen the evils of slavery by white preachers like um, George Whitfield and um, from an account of a revival in Charleston you see there that Whitfield did take a personal interest in the salvation of um, blacks as well as whites and apparently the news of this got around in the black community at least to the point that the African-American poet um, Phyllis Wheatley was moved to write an elegy on the death of George Whitfield in 17 uh, 70 that was full of praise um, for him um, as a great um, religious leader but again this is a case of agency and and we can say that quite a large number of blacks um, converted to Christianity at revivals of uh, the first great awakening and some who were already Christians really embraced um, the whole approach um, that was being taken at the uh, revivals. Now, why would they do that? First of all, <clears throat> um, revivals were, in many cases, integrated. <laughs> now, that was not always the case, and it was not the case everywhere, but in many places and uh, many times, the revivals were integrated. And so this was a chance for African Americans to uh, meet whites at least somewhat on a field of spiritual um, equality and there were cases also where um, African Americans at uh, revivals would um, complain of their ill uh, treatment and masters who were all, all also participating in the revivals would in a sense be led to repentance for that ill treatment. And so there was at least the possibility of getting um, better treatment, especially if your master happened to be involved in, in the revival that you, that you were also attending. Also, I think, and, and maybe even more importantly, was the fact that at many revivals, the religious experiences of African Americans were heard and they were taken um, seriously as valid uh, religious experience okay um, and also I'm going to skip down t uh, to the uh, uh, the second bullet point after that because I think this is also very important too that certain um, ceremonies and rituals that took place at the revival such as the laying on of hands the washing of feet sharing of food and a love feast giving people the quote-unquote right hand of fellowship and the kiss of charity, anointing the sick with oil. Um, all of these had to be, in a way, new experiences for um, many African Americans who were obviously subject to all kinds of physical cruelty on a daily basis, extremely hard work, um, very little uh, nourishing food, and of course uh, brutal beatings and, and other even worse um, tortures. And so to attend an integrated revival and to be treated with uh, humanity and to even receive uh, an affirming physical touch had to be uh, a tremendously attractive draw, I think, for, for blacks to come to the revivals. Um, also, in the First Great Awakening, uh, there was a great emphasis on uh, preaching and hearing the word and speaking rather than on the written word. So this dovetailed with the general orality of African-American culture. And finally, this is, this is very important. 
a lot of the practices that we just talked about, uh, the syncretistic practices which African Americans brought with them from Africa, such as the ring shout and so forth, did become a part of First Great Awakening revivals, and they were welcomed in in most in many cases. <laughs> okay, and so the real embodied approach that African Americans took to um, religion in which they would uh, experience physical mani manifestations um, this came into the revivals and actually was embraced by many white um, Christians um, so for example sometimes black and white revivalists would get what was called the jerks where there would be a sort of spasmodic twitching of the whole body um, also spiritual laughter um, I, this, this sounds really unusual, but I've actually seen YouTube videos of, um, actually the one I saw was a predominantly white congregation engaging in this spiritual laughter as a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's, it was quite fascinating. Um, but this is documented as, as having been performed by African American Christians at these first Great Awakening revivals. And also what came to be known in white circles as the following exercise, which was simply the traditional African-American practice of falling out or being slain um, in the spirit. Um, and so um, if the predominantly white preachers of the First Great Awakening influenced black Christians, we can also say that the black Christians who came to the revivals did very much influence um, the spirituality of whites who attended there. Um, so much so that, uh, for instance, the Pentecostal churches of today and, and, and some other churches um, do manifest some of these same, um, these same practices in their worship. And also, uh, coming out of uh, the awakening, um, both the Methodist and the Baptist churches did uh, license uh, not ordained ministers, but what they called exhorters and preachers from uh, the African American community. Now in the South, both of those denominations later would really, um, in a sense, turn their backs on um, black Christians, partly as a result of the slave revolts um, instigated by black religious um, leaders. But at least during this awakening period, um, this did happen and so this was an opportunity for African Americans to start um, their own um, separate churches uh, in, 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 in certain places. For example, um, in Savannah, Georgia, the first African Baptist Church was founded by uh, George Lyle and when he went to serve as a missionary to Jamaica uh, in 1784, his uh, position as the pastor of that church was taken over by um, Andrew Bryan, who also founded the first Bryan Baptist Church also in um, Savannah. So the, you see, uh, in a way, especially in Georgia, these um, African-American exhorters and preachers had a, a tremendous impact. And also black women became noteworthy leaders, especially in the Methodist Church, because um, Part of Methodist practice is to have what are called um, class meetings, uh, which would often take place in people's um, homes. And so, um, in keeping with the practices of the early Christian church, women would uh, would preside um, at those meetings and um, and run them. And in independent Black congregations as well, uh, women would serve um, extremely important. Uh, and vital uh, leadership uh, roles. Uh, I said that um, even prominent white ministers and figures of the First Great Awakening did at times um, openly and explicitly em embrace the distinctive um, black spirituality. For instance, we have Whitfield's comment about a, a revival that took place in Philadelphia in May 1740 about a participant whom he describes as a poor Negro woman. Quote, the word came with such power to her heart that at last she was obliged to cry out, and a great concern fell heavily on many of the congregation. End quote. Uh, 
Um, so you see really what he's doing here is is giving her credit for starting this great concern and um, when I, I think you can remember from our last discussions about the stages of conversion uh, this idea of being concerned that I might not be saved or I might not be going to heaven was considered to be an important step on the road to the the new birth that people were seeking at these um, revivals also uh, we have a quote from John Haggerty who participated in a Memphis revival uh, which started at a class meeting in Annapolis in 1789 and apparently there was an African-American woman who was sitting in a hallway groaning and praying in great distress however after some time she received that gift of assurance from God that she was born again that she was definitely going to heaven and another African-American woman received that assurance as well and so um, what wound up happening was that this in a way spread through um, the whole meeting and that very night there were 15 more people converted of whom at least six uh, are known to to have been white and so you see here again African Americans playing a leadership role in these um, revivals and in a sense um, instigating or drawing other people to have the kinds of experiences that they prized. However, <laughs> as you might expect, there were certainly many cases where um, whites who were involved in the Great Awakening pulled back or balked a little bit um, at some manifestations of the syncretism that we've been um, talking about. For instance, in approximately 1800 in North Carolina there was a case where um, a slave who is only known to us as Aunt Katie was excommunicated that is kicked out of a Methodist church because while praying she had quote with many extravagant gestures cried out that she was young King Jesus end quote well we can recognize that as a an example of spirit possession in the sense that she felt that the spirit of Jesus was um, inhabiting her at that moment but um, for these white Methodists uh, this would have been um, blasphemy in a sense because she, they, they would have seen it as her claiming to be uh, God um, also <laughs> there were places and times when white awakeners were exposed to um, distinctive African-American worship styles and uh, ran away in horror as this description from Richmond in 1777 uh, tells us um, most of the whites frightened left the house in confusion at, and dismay when some African Americans with strong cries and tears called um, for, for mercy so this acceptance by white Christians in the awakening that I'm talking about certainly was not um, universal um, going back during the, the Whitfield preaching tour there was an interesting episode in South Carolina where a white minister named Hugh Bryan had uh, founded a church called the Stony Creek Independent Presbyterian Church uh, which was the first non-Anglican non-Church of England church in South Carolina by the way um, Hugh Bryan's brother was uh, the owner of Andrew Bryan the African-American minister when he was still a slave so so there is a connection between the two Bryans but anyway um, Bryan was anti-slavery <clears throat> and in 1741 he wrote a letter prophesying that the slaves would be free and in fact would rebel to get um, their freedom um, and he was uh, expecting God to shower down his wrath on um, on slaveholders who persisted in owning slaves so this is the kind of rhetoric you would get later from people like John Brown during the run-up to the Civil War but this was way back in 1741 and so um, you see one white awakener here who definitely uh, was trying to promote at least the freedom of, of slaves now he was you know uh, brought up before the authorities and they if he wanted to keep his church they let it be known he had to retract this statement and so um, so he did but uh, so we can't give him complete credit for courage there but it certainly was um, uh, 
an interesting moment of resistance uh, to slavery by a white um, leader. And I already mentioned earlier in the lecture um, two of the several incidents in which African-American religious leaders triggered uh, episodes of rebellion like Denmark Vesey in 1822 and Nat Turner's rebellion in uh, 1831. Well, um, before we end here, I just want to make a comment about the readings that you're going to be reading for um, this week because uh, this is kind of unusual. Um, the readings are, in a sense, testimonies of mostly ex-slaves, elderly people who were interviewed uh, in the late 1920s by A.P. Watson, who was a graduate student at Fisk, which is an HBCU in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so you may ask, well, how can this be a source for this early period of black Christianity? Well, it, it's really all we've got. The problem is that um, especially as the 1800s went on and a lot of black religion had to go underground um, because black, many black praise houses were destroyed by white slave owners, especially after the Nat Turner Rebellion, there are essentially no records um, from this early period written by African-American Christians that tell us what their worship and, and um, what their spirituality was like. So when there's a situation like that, um, sometimes historians will do what they call upstreaming, and this was something that was pioneered with um, Native American history, where um, people in more modern times are interviewed, and we hope, and to some extent we assume, that their experiences reflect some continuity with um, the earlier uh, traditions that they're um, coming out of. So it's not, you know, as a standard of historical evidence, it's not perfect, but it's really what we've got. And so we will make the most of it um, in these uh, discussions. And I look forward to hearing your comments on these interesting readings from the book um, God struck me dead. So these are, again, personal testimonies from African-American um, Christians talking about their own uh, personal religious experiences.